My name is Andrei Derevanka, I'm from the University of Nevada, Rina, and uh, I'm going to chair this session. So this session is on uh, uh, test of fundamental physics with, uh, with atoms, so it is a long-standing tradition in atomic physics. So and the, the first speaker is uh, David DeMille from uh, Yale, so he's going to talk to, uh, about uh, the search for the electric dipole moment of electron. Thanks, Andre. Uh, so I'd like to join the other speakers in thanking Trey and Gretchen, wherever they are, for their efforts in, in organizing the conference. It's really been a great meeting. Uh, so uh, as Andre said, I'll be telling you today about our, our experiment called ACME, where we're searching to see if the electron has an electric dipole moment. And uh, we had one poster about this yesterday. There'll be another one in today's session about the, the future progression of the ACME experiment. Uh, but before I dive in to tell you about ACME, just thought I'd take a second to mention some of the other work that's happening in my group at Yale. Uh, we have a poster today on our experiments to measure parity violation using molecules. We had a poster yesterday where uh, some of you saw that we had been able to make a MOT out of diatomic molecules for the first time. And we have a poster today on making ultra-cold rubidium cesium molecules. Uh, but that's just an aside. Let me now get on to the main story which is about the ACME experiment to look for the electron-electric dipole moment. Here's a quick uh, outline of my talk. I'll tell you a bit about the, the motivation, particle physics motivation for these experiments, tell you about our particular experimental approach, uh, how we do our measurements in the ACME experiment, how we analyze our data and think about uncertainties, and then tell you about the new upper bound from ACME uh, and, and the future of our experiment and the, and the field more generally. So uh, the actual experiment, of course, has been done by uh, a really exceptional team of graduate students and postdocs. This is a, a, a mixture of students and postdocs from both Harvard and Yale. The experiment actually takes place on the Harvard campus. Uh, all, all the students and postdocs come from the groups of, of uh, we three PIs, me, John Doyle, who's here, and Jerry, Gar Jerry Gabriels, both from, from Harvard. And when we started this experiment, we decided uh, to, to follow a slightly different path than the, the usual path of EDM measurements historically in the AMO field to try to pool our resources, uh, pool our expertise, and hopefully even pool some wisdom together from the three of us working together. Uh, and, and I think what we really did was pool together an amazing group of, of students and postdocs shown here. The top group is the group who had the pleasure of being around for the final data taking. Uh, the middle group uh, missed the, the final bit of fun at the end, but many of them really contributed uh, very important pieces to the experiment as it was being developed. So uh, let's start off by talking about why are EDMs interesting? Why are we looking for this electron electric dipole moment? And it really boils down to the fact that uh, an EDM, if it exists, violates fundamental symmetries such as time reversal and parity. Uh, so you can very crudely imagine semi-classically an electric dipole moment of an electron in the following way. The electron is a ball of charge spinning around some axis. An electric dipole moment along the spin axis, if it pointed in some other direction as the electron spun around, it would average to zero. So together you can imagine this very crudely uh, as a ball of charge with a little bulge on one side and a dent on the other side aligned with the spin axis. So if all electrons look like this, then both the time reversed and the parity transformed version of this electron don't exist. So for example, if you take this picture in reverse time, the spin changes direction, but the electric dipole moment, which is a static charge distribution, doesn't, and you get an object which is not like the object that you presumed all electrons look like. Uh, and likewise with a parity transformation. So if electrons have an electric dipole moment along their spin, then time reversal is not a good symmetry of nature. And in quantum field theories, uh, there's, uh, it's well known that CPT, the combined uh, symmetry of charge conjugation, parity transformation, and a time reversal transformation has to be uh, satisfied so that T violation is equivalent to CP violation. And if you hear the language of particle physicists, they'll usually refer to CP violation, but it's really equivalent to T violation. And therefore, looking for EDMs is equivalent to looking for or studying CP violation in particle physics. 
Uh, so it's long been understood, recognized, that time reversal violation is really a very powerful window to looking for new phenomena in particle physics. And, and let me take you through the argument for why that's the case. So we've known for decades now that, that CP, or equivalently T, is not a good symmetry of nature. It's, it's violated in decays of K mesons and B mesons. Uh, so once the symmetry has been broken in nature, there's every reason to believe it will be broken in other ways. Uh, and I'll just point out that the, the mathematical description of time reversal violation always boils down to being associated with some irreducible complex phases in a theory. So I'll often refer to these complex phases uh, as, as uh, an important part of the parameterization of T violation. Okay, so the, the observations of T violation in particle physics, in these decays of K and B mesons, can be completely understood within the context of the standard model of particle physics. It turns out there's one way to introduce CP violation into the standard model. It's via the, a complex phase, a single complex phase that enters this matrix that describes the mixing of, of quark mass eigenstates with quark weak eigenstates. So this, this, is, uh, this is really sort of a peculiar mechanism uh, that seems to be an accident of the fact that nature has at least three families of quarks. It's not something that seems to be built fundamentally into the theory, yet it, it crops up and it does explain everything that's seen. Nevertheless, because the, the predictions of theory for how large these T-violating effects should be are not very precise, it's quite easy to uh, fit in new sources of T-violation arising from very high energy phenomena that are completely consistent with everything that's been seen so far. Uh, even though everything that's been seen is also consistent with the standard model description. Uh, so because this way of introducing CP or equivalently T violation in the standard model is, is such a backdoor route, it, it's in some sense a minimal way to introduce CP violation, it turns out that if you take a particle physics theory that starts with a standard model and adds some new phenomena to it, as it must, then it's it's almost impossible to do that without adding in some new sources of time reversal violation. So uh, if there's new physics beyond the standard model, it's extremely likely that that new physics will bring with it new ways of violating time reversal. Uh, which you might consider a, a bug, uh, an unwanted complication, but it actually is a feature of extensions to the standard model because it's an observed fact about the universe that there's much more matter than antimatter. And this is really one of the deepest mysteries in, in particle physics and cosmology, because according to the standard model of particle physics, uh, at the Big Bang, when matter was created out of energy, there should have been equal amounts of matter and antimatter created, and yet now we see that all the antimatter is gone and matter persists. So Sakharov pointed out decades ago now that this requires T violation in order to explain. And it's been understood in the decades since that the, stand, the, the T violation that exists in the standard model is not sufficient to explain the degree to which matter has, has won out over antimatter in the universe. So in order to explain this observation about the universe, we require some new sources of T violation. So how does this T violation in, in particle physics show up in our humble everyday electron? And the answer is that it, it really arises as a radiative correction, which you can go pretty far in thinking about heuristically as a sort of cloud of accompanying virtual particles that every electron carries around. Uh, so for example, in the standard model, the electron can emit a virtual W particle, which can split into a virtual quark anti quark pair, and so on. And because there's time reversal violation built into the standard model, the electron gets an, electron, gets an electric dipole moment from diagrams like this. But in the standard model, it requires a diagram like this, a very complicated diagram, a four-loop diagram, which corresponds, corresponds to fourth-order perturbation theory. And in addition, in the standard model, all the fourth-order diagrams that you can think of, when you add them all up, they cancel to some extremely high order. So in the standard model, the electron has an electric dipole moment, but it's fantastically small. By contrast, in theories like supersymmetric models, a much simpler process, even in many models, a first order uh, Feynman diagram, a one loop diagram, can give rise to uh, an electric dipole moment of the electron. And this is really the fundamental reason why 
looking for the EDM of the electron or other types of particles turns out to be a powerful way to look for these new physical processes is because uh, this can appear at a much larger level in these alternate theories than it does in the standard model. So it's easy to write down a sort of simple hand-waving dimensional estimate for how big the electric dipole moment would be if you try to cook up a generic theory of particle physics. So here's the simplest sort of Feynman diagram that can describe the electron's EDM. And uh, uh, the sort of typical assumptions uh, that theorists tend to make is that, well, these, these coupling constants that describe the coupling of the electron to a new particle, they can't be much weaker than electromagnetism. That's our, the weakest quantum field theory we know about. Uh, it requires a T-violating phase, but the one phase that we know of in nature, this quark mixing phase, is about a radian. So let's assume that this phase is also uh, has a sign of order one. And then we believe, for a variety of reasons, that new particles should exist at a mass scale comparable to the mass of the Higgs boson, uh, about 0.1 TeV. So with these assumptions, uh, let's write down our hand-waving estimate uh, for how big the EDM might be. Well, in a sensible system of units, an electric dipole moment and a magnetic dipole moment have the same uh, units. So the natural scale for the EDM is a Bohr magneton. And then uh, this one loop diagram looks like the diagram that you would draw for the G minus two factor of the electron if this were a photon. So you can imagine that uh, for a one loop diagram, you get a factor of alpha over pi. For a, an n loop diagram, you get this factor to the nth power. But then because this particle is some new hypothetical heavy particle rather than a photon, there's an additional suppression which ends up looking like the, the ratio of the electron mass to the heavy particle mass squared. And then the CP violating phase has to be non-zero and you get a factor of sine phi. So if you put in these, these uh, typical assumptions, uh, put in the numbers here, what you find is that you would estimate an electron EDM which is already 100 times bigger than what has been ruled out by previous experiments. So that gives you a clue that uh, these EDM experiments are already pushing pretty hard into the space of, of predictions and natural assumptions for particle theories. So to try to summarize the, the situation, here's a sort of simple-minded experimentalist cartoonish uh, summary of everything uh, that's been written about EDMs in particle, by particle theorists. And this shows on a logarithmic scale predictions for the electron EDM. The blue splotches are variants of supersymmetric theories. The other colors are, are variants of other, other models that are not supersymmetric. What's shown here is the upper bounds uh, from recent experiments, and the best bound uh, before ACME came from the, the beautiful experiment by Ed Hines Group at Imperial College using ytterbium fluoride molecules. So you can see a few features here. For example, the most naive predictions of supersymmetry were really pretty well ruled out already. And EDM results really resulted in a flurry of new theoretical activity to try to understand how, these, how EDMs could be suppressed within these supersymmetric particle uh, theories. And particle theorists are both numerous and clever, so they came up with lots of ways to evade this constraint. But their, their predictions very generically tend to predict EDMs within the next couple of orders of magnitude beyond the previous best limit. Also point out the standard model value here, which is many orders of magnitude below the current limit. Uh, so we're in no danger of, of uh, reaching that anytime soon. Okay, so that's the particle physics background. Let me tell you how we do our measurement now. Uh, we follow the general idea of most EDM measurements. We start with our, our electrons, with their spins in random directions. We use a laser to uh, effectively optically pump them and spin polarize them. Let's say we polarize them sideways. That's a superposition of spin up and spin down. Then for technical reasons, we apply a magnetic field. That, that exerts a torque and causes the, the electron spin to start processing around the field or equivalently causes some Zeeman splitting between spin up and spin down. Uh, then if the electron has an EDM, if we apply an electric field parallel to the magnetic field, that exerts an additional torque or causes an additional Zeeman splitting. Uh, then we can uh, reverse the electric field and look for that splitting to uh, change in magnitude. And we simply flip the electric field back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until the graduate students can't take it anymore. Uh, but this, this simple picture gives you a, a quick idea of what a figure of merit for the statistical sensitivity of an experiment like this is. It's the energy shift divided by the energy resolution. 
And this tells you that you want a big electric field, a long coherence time for observing the spin to give good energy resolution, a good contrast, which is the ability to tell between spin pointing to the left and spin pointing to the right, uh, good statistics, and a long integration time. Uh, and, and all of us in the field try to maximize this quantity. Uh, so the new trend in the field that uh, Ed Hines' group started and, and we've been working on for a while and now ACME has really pushed to its, its fullest extent is to amplify the electric field that's acting on the EDM by putting the electrons in a polar molecule. And the basic idea is simply that molecules are very easy to polarize. And in a cartoonish way, you can imagine if you apply an electric field and polarize a molecule like thorium oxide, which is a nice ionic molecule, the electron wave function, which is spread out throughout the molecule, spends a lot of time in between these two ions and experiences some intramolecular electric field, which can be much larger than the field you needed to apply to polarize the molecule. That sweeps some important physics under the rug, but it gets to the basic story of what's going on. And you can make a hand-waving estimate for how big that electric field is. What, you, uh, what was pointed out by Pat Sanders many decades ago was that the electric field vanishes except for some relativistic effects. But with a heavy atom like thorium where the nuclear charge Z is big, the relativistic effects can actually be very large. Uh, the, the electron is moving very relativistically when it gets near the thorium nucleus. And if you put in numbers here, what you find is a hand-waving estimate uh, for this effective electric field would be on the order of 80 gigavolts per centimeter, uh, even though you're only applying fields of a few volts per centimeter in the lab to polarize the molecule. There are now uh, some initial uh, crude calculations that have been superseded by more sophisticated ab initio many body calculations. Uh, in, in this talk, I'll use this value that came out just before our publication. There's a newer newer value, which if it holds up, will represent by far the most accurate calculation of an effective field in a molecule. Uh, I think this is still in, in flux to some extent. Uh, but uh, at any rate, I would say the takeaway message here is that remarkably, despite the complexity of molecular structure, the theory that's required to determine these effective electric fields is now widely agreed on at the 20% level or better. Uh, also point out that for this to work, you need unpaired electron spins uh, if, because the EDMs are coupled to the spins. If the electrons come in closed shells, the, the EDMs will also pair off. And molecules with unpaired electron spins are, are known as free radicals, uh, and they're experimentally very challenging to deal with. Uh, in our experiments, we, we take advantage of a particular feature of molecular structure known as omega doublet states. These are associated, for example, with molecules like ours that are in a spin triplet state. So we have not just one, but two unpaired valence electrons in a spin triplet in our experiments. Uh, unlike in atoms, the additional degree of freedom of the molecular axis in a diatomic means that there's some additional structure uh, associated with whether the, the molecular axis is pointed along or against the spin in a system. It turns out that uh, this, this sorts out into states of opposite parity uh, corresponding to even or odd superpositions of the molecular axis relative to the spin. Uh, these levels are typically very close together. In thorium oxide, they're only about 100 kilohertz apart. Uh, but we, we work with these systems in an electric field that mixes these opposite parity states, causes them to repel, and this mixing and repulsion corresponds to the electric polarization of the molecule. So for example, uh, these states went up in energy. They polarized opposite the electric field. These states go down in energy because they polarized along the electric field in the right direction. Uh, and essentially what we're trying to do is measure the energy difference between spin up and spin down uh, for the electrons that are experiencing this effective electric field inside the molecule. But in our experiments, we can either measure this difference in this top pair of states or in the bottom pair. And notice that because the molecular polarization flips over as you go from this pair to this pair, the energy shift associated with the EDM has to change sign when you go between them. Uh, and this turns out to be a very powerful way to cancel systematics. Essentially, these states are almost mirror images of each other, and many systematic errors cancel by comparing the EDM shifts uh, in this pair of states compared to this pair. Uh, a key technical advance that really led us to, to think about starting the ATME experiment was the development of a new molecular beam technology, which we call hydrodynamically enhanced cryogenic buffer gas beams. This grew out of early work. There was a collaboration between my group and John Doyle's group, 
But the real key advance came from just uh, a very deep and, and I would say even genius level understanding from Dave Patterson and John Doyle, who realized that by running these in a very particular regime of gas flow, it's possible to get extraordinarily high fluxes out of these uh, molecular sources, something like a thousand times larger than previous sources of molecular uh, species of the type that are needed for EDM experiments. So this really uh, encouraged us to think about starting an experiment based on a molecular beam of this type. Uh, our experiment uses the molecule thorium monoxide, THO. It's actually not a free radical. In its ground state, it has closed shells. Uh, but we actually do the measurement in the first excited state, which is a metastable state that, as I said, has a spin triplet. Uh, and, and it's this state that has the large effective electric field and has this omega doublet structure that allows us to both easily polarize the molecule and, and suppress many systematic errors. To get into this state, uh, or sorry, uh, this, this state, we uh, made, made some estimates and then did some early measurements to confirm that this state has uh, a pretty long lifetime, about two milliseconds, which is comparable to coherence times that have been used in previous experiments and long enough uh, for our purposes. So uh, in addition, we chose this state in large part uh, sort of uh, blatantly stealing the ideas that had come out of the Jilla group where they had pointed out that this particular molecular symmetry, the triplet delta one state, uh, has a cancellation between the spin magnetic moment and the orbital magnetic moment. So this state is largely non-magnetic. Its magnetic moment is less than 1% of a Bohr magneton, despite the fact that it has two unpaired electron spins. So that really suppresses many systematic errors. Uh, in addition, everything was known spectroscopically about thorium oxide. There was tremendous detail about the energy level spectrum which meant that we knew, for example, that we could populate the state by optically pumping with a nice convenient diode laser wavelength, that we could probe it uh, with a nice convenient diode laser wavelength, and that it would emit fluorescent light at a nice convenient fluorescent light wavelength. Uh, so it, it's experimentally quite easy to work with uh, from a spectroscopic point of view. And then finally we verified, and this was, this was not cleverness, this was just sheer dumb luck, that uh, uh, vaporization of thorium dioxide by laser ablation gave us a nice, nice intense beam. Uh, that's still a bit of black magic, but it worked well for us, luckily. Okay, so here's a quick schematic of the ACME experiment. It starts with uh, molecules traveling from left to right. Uh, they start in a cryogenic buffer gas beam source. They first encounter a region of rotational cooling where a handful of lasers optically pump different rotational states into the rotational state that we actually use. Uh, then the molecules fly into a region that's magnetically shielded where there are parallel electric and magnetic fields. They encounter two lasers, one of which optically pumps them into this metastable state, and then another laser which spin polarizes them uh, to create the spin superposition we want. Then the molecules fly freely for about 20 centimeters uh, in, in this region of electric and magnetic fields where if they have, where there's their spin processes due to the magnetic moment, and if they have an EDM, it processes a little bit more or less. And then we, at the end, we detect the, how the spins are pointing using fluorescence and, and photomultiplier tubes. So here's some pictures of the apparatus. Uh, this is the cryogenic molecular beam source. This is the main vacuum chamber with end caps of magnetic shields. Inside the vacuum chamber, there's our electric field plates, which are indium tin oxide coated glass. The Preparation and probe laser beams punch right through this glass as the molecules go between the field plates. We collect fluorescence with a system of high numerical aperture lenses, fiber optic bundles, light pipes, and phototubes. Uh, so here's the apparatus with magnetic field coils assembled. I put this scale on there for LHC physicists to understand how big our experiments are. Uh, Here's the whole thing uh, with the magnetic shields buttoned up and some of the optics, uh, last stage optics around the experiment. Uh, and then the, the optical part of the experiment looks not so different from what you're used to in a typical laser cooling BC experiment. Uh, the, the, the main thing that's different here is that for a variety of reasons we end up having our primary lasers in another room in another building and the light is, is carried over by a few hundred meters of optical fiber. So uh, let me tell you how the experiment actually proceeds. So as molecules enter the interaction region, they encounter this pump laser that optically pumps them into the metastable state. 
This results in an incoherent superposition of all the sublevels that might be of interest for us to measure. Uh, they next fly into this state preparation laser, which is linearly polarized. This is a coherent superposition of sigma plus and sigma minus light. So it pumps out a particular coherent superposition of these two M sublevels uh, and leaves behind the, the orthogonal coherent superposition. These levels are out of resonance with the laser, so we don't detect them, or we can tune the laser to detect those instead. But let's focus on this pair. Uh, so the laser pumps out uh, one coherent superposition, leaves behind this coherent spin superposition. The molecules then fly and uh, their spin processes in the combined electric and magnetic fields. Uh, they build up a relative phase between spin up and spin down that's determined by the EDM and the, and the magnetic moment. Uh, and then at the end, we, we want to detect what direction the spin is pointing. Uh, so the way we do that is a, is a little bit novel. Uh, so here's, here's where we are as we enter the probe region. So we can rewrite this final state after the spin is processed as a superposition of states that either uh, absorb X polarization and are dark to Y polarization or vice versa. So when the molecules enter this probe region, we initially hit them with linearly polarized light along the X direction. Uh, if they're in this particular superposition, they get excited and emit a photon that we can detect. Uh, and that happens with probability sine squared theta. But uh, when they interact with this laser, it forces the wave function to collapse. So either they emit a photon or the wave function collapses into the orthogonal superposition. This happens with probability cosine squared theta. But before the molecules have a chance to leave, we switch the polarization to the y direction and then excite these and, and collect uh, photons from them uh, so that we were essentially detecting both quadratures of this spin superposition. Uh, then we form an asymmetry, which is the difference of those signals over the sum. That's uh, equal to cosine of twice the spin precession angle. So that's a way we can read out this spin precession angle. And uh, this switching back and forth so that we detect both, uh, both states, possible states of each molecule uh, is insensitive to variations in the molecule flux. And we saw that we could get signal to noise that's limited by shot noise in the photoelectrons. Uh, we can also play tricks like rotating the polarization of these probe, uh, probe lasers, and it's pretty easy to work out this. All this does is uh, transform our signal from cosine 2 phi to cosine minus 2 phi. We can also include the, the effect of backgrounds uh, by encoding a, a finite contrast on our, our spin rotation fringes. So here's, here's typical data with the spin rotation fringe. This is showing as we, as we rotate the angle of our, our spin detection uh, uh, polarization analysis direction. Uh, and the basic idea is we, we set the experiment, for example, to take data here where there's a big slope of asymmetry versus phase that gives us a big sensitivity to the EDM. Uh, we can also... Uh, dither the polarization angle to measure the slope of this and, and extract the contrast so we know how sensitive our measurements are in real time. And uh, it's quite gratifying. Our, our spin contrast here is routinely 95%, so, so very good spin fringes. Okay, um, so taking you through some of our data analysis, uh, the only real cut that we make in our data is a signal size cut. So if the fluorescence signal is too small, the denominator in that asymmetry can fluctuate too close to zero and cause some non-Gaussian statistics. Uh, so we just make sure that we only look at data when the signal is big enough. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the only cut we take on our data that's, that's substantial. Then we calculate this asymmetry at every point in time as we're rapidly chopping the, the polarization to form an asymmetry. Then we bin these together, find an average and a standard error. and it, Almost all the way up to the very end, our, our error propagation is not much more sophisticated than simple undergraduate uh, data analysis techniques. So no, no tricks are played or no sophistication here. Okay, so uh, here's our data taking sequence. As promised, we flip our electric field back and forth many, many times. We do it most quickly by switching between the molecular state that's polarized in one direction and another direction just by tuning lasers. Then less frequently, we flip the actual laboratory electric field 
we dither the, the polarization of our probe beam to determine the contrast, and we occasionally reverse the magnetic field. Uh, so uh, this, this gives us lots of data that we sort into things that we call machine states that are determined by the sign of the internal molecular polarization, the external electric field, or the magnetic field, things that we denote with these tildes. So how do we make sense of all this data? We're, we're determining spin rotation angles for our machine in, in many, many different states. Uh, what we do is we rewrite the, this spin precession phase as components that are correlated with various switches in the experiment. So we, we use a superscript to say that this is the phase that's odd under this particular reversal and even under all the others. The EDM phase is the particular part of the phase that's odd under reversal of the molecular polarization and the external electric field, but not odd under the magnetic field. And then we use all the other phases here, for example these, to both do calibration and to diagnose possible systematic errors. So the idea is really that we can correlate or we can identify these different switch correlated phases with different physical contributions to the phases that we measure. So to give you, well, sorry, well, I'll give an example of that in a second, but first let's just look at the statistics of this EDM phase. So uh, we collect data for a, a total of about 100 hours to contribute to our EDM result, many times this to, to study systematic errors. Here's a histogram of our data. You can see it's nice and Gaussian. The one, one sigma standard deviation is uh, about 25 times smaller than the previous upper limit. Uh, as we did this, we did a blind analysis, so there was a hidden offset added. So as, as we did, took our data, we didn't know whether the EDM was zero or not. Uh, we could only see if it moved when we did something. Uh, if you look at this histogram on a log scale, you can see this, this data is fantastically Gaussian. It's, it's fully Gaussian all the way out to the very edges of the distribution beyond three sigma, uh, which is uh, quite amazing and, and gratifying, I would say. Uh, so the, the statistical properties of our data look fantastic, but in this business, uh, a big part of the game is what are your systematic errors? In fact, that's the main part of the game. Uh, so as I said, we can use these other uh, correlated phases as a way to diagnose systematics. So uh, when we started, we knew, for example, that there were possible systematic contributions to this uh, EDM phase beyond the electron EDM. There could be spurious effects, for example, due to uh, magnetic fields from leakage currents associated with the electric field or uh, a slight non-reversing electric field which coupled with a slight electric field dependence of the G factors of the states can lead to a, a contribution to this channel. So we had a long list of things like this, each of which we, we understood that we could uh, diagnose by looking at these other phases. So for example, uh, these particular ones that, that concerned us uh, as we were getting started, uh, we realized appear in other correlated phases but with enormous amplification factors. So for example, the phase which is not, which is odd under electric field reversal but even with respect to reversing the internal molecular polarization also has a term proportional to the leakage current magnetic field but with a coefficient which is a thousand times bigger than the term in the EDM. And likewise for this term there's an amplification of nearly a factor of a thousand. So this meant that uh, as long as these phases, which are not uh, associated with the EDM, are small, then we know that the contributions of the leakage current magnetic field or, or this effect to the EDM are, are really negligible. Um, so uh, as I said, we had this long list of things that we knew to be worried about, and we quickly understood that these were not a problem. But the question is always, what about the things that you don't anticipate? How, how do you, how do you uh, uh, dig those out uh, and see if they're possibly contributing? So we had a few strategies. One was to change as many parameters as we could that should not affect the EDM, such as the magnitude of the electric field or the magnetic field, the global polarization directions. Uh, and the other was to deliberately amplify imperfections in the experiment. Go and turn a knob and screw something up deliberately and see if it makes your value for the EDM move. Uh, and if it does, you, you have to understand why. So here's a list of the extra reversals that, that we included. It's a pretty long list. Uh, each of them was expected to, to leave the EDM phase unchanged, but could change 
the effect of certain other imperfections and systematic effects. And this is, I would say, the most extensive list of knobs that's been available to any EDM experiment. And our data, gratifyingly, was, was quite consistent under all these changes. Uh, we also had an even longer list of, of knobs that we turned to screw something up in the experiment uh, uh, to deliberately amplify imperfections. Uh, whenever we, we deliberately amplified an imperfection, deliberately screwed something up, we didn't include that in the EDM data uh, so that we wouldn't accidentally contaminate the data. So in the search for these systematic errors, uh, we had so many different ways of looking for them that we had to start thinking of them as st statistical distribution. So here's a histogram of uh, the various channels in which we look for systematic errors. And you can see it's a nice Gaussian distribution, as it should be. However, unlike our real EDM data, here there were some, some outliers in the wings, and these were the ones that we had to work to understand. And we had a variety of ways of doing that, such as these plots that show how every possible phase uh, is, is the strength of its correlation with various knobs that we turned in the experiment. Um, so I won't take you through the whole story, but let me give you a case study of one particularly nasty systematic error that spent us some time to deal with that's associated with three things being wrong at the same time. Uh, so uh, the fundamental cause of this systematic effect is just an AC Stark shift, that uh, if our laser is not tuned exactly on resonance, it, uh, the, the probe or state preparation or probing laser can cause an AC Stark shift. But uh, we had thought about this, and, and to zeroth order, this shouldn't be able to do anything. Uh, because you need to uh, have an AC Stark shift which is correlated with the reversal of the internal molecular polarization in the external electric field. But it turns out you can do that if you have a non-reversing component of the field because when you reverse the field, the magnitude of the electric field changes. That changes the DC Stark shifts in these levels in a way that exactly gives detunings that are anti or that uh, change sign with the molecular polarization and with the external electric field. Uh, so that's dangerous, but even that was not enough to actually cause a systematic error. Uh, what we needed in addition was uh, some way to, to couple those AC Stark shifts to a spin precession. And our, our technique of, of preparing states was such that if the laser polarization was constant, uh, or sorry, if the laser polarization changed or if the intensity uh, changed, but only one of those happened, we couldn't generate a systematic effect. But if both the laser polarization and the intensity changed at the same time, we could have a non-adiabatic evolution that led to some uh, AC Stark shift that looked like a spin precession. Uh, so this, this seems pretty exotic, uh, but it turned out it was built into our experiment. As I mentioned, our laser beams go through our electric field plates. Uh, there is some small absorption of the lasers in the field plates that led to heating and thermal expansion of the field plates. That led to a stress-induced birefringence, which led to a laser ellipticity gradient, which was correlated with the intensity gradient of the laser. Uh, so that, not surprisingly, took us a little while to work out. But uh, ultimately, we were able to, to uh, find ways to suppress this effect. Here's what we saw with a deliberately applied non-reversing field at the beginning. The EDM phase changed a lot as we deliberately amplified this non-reversing field. And at the end, we could suppress it down to, to consistent with zero. We could also use the microwave spectroscopy of Stark effects in the molecules to put very strong limits and, and very uh, precise measurements of the non-reversing field, which was very small in our apparatus. Uh, so, in the end, this gave us a small residual systematic uncertainty uh, at, at a negligible level. So here's our systematic error budget. You have to do this sort of thing in our experiment. Uh, each one of these is a little tale of its own, which I won't go into. Uh, but the bottom line is that our systematic uncertainty was limit, limited by our ability to make, or by our willingness to, to integrate statistics as we measured these effects, and in the end was smaller than our statistical error bar. Uh, uh, and, and we applied negligible systematic shifts. So uh, to summarize, here's a sort of artist's conception of our result, which is zero. Uh, we saw that the electron within our accuracy has no electric dipole moment. But uh, this will put it in the context of this plot that I showed you before. Uh, here's our, our central value, the, the statistic and, statistical and systematic error bars. 
uh, and this all adds up to uh, uh, a limit that the electron EDM has to be less than about 9 times 10 to the minus 29 e centimeters. This depends on the theory value, but uh, as I said, this should be accurate to within 20% at least and maybe better. Um, maybe just to, to put this in a little bit of context in the, in the LHC era, this is a, a plot from a particle theorist that shows uh, limits on various masses of supersymmetric particles. The blue lines are the direct limits from the LHC that say the particles have to be heavier than this. Uh, our, this was the previous EDM result, which is below the, the green line, which shows what this theorist considers to be a natural level. But now with our new result, we pushed uh, the masses of these particles to well above the level that the theorists consider natural. So uh, this, is, this is really having an impact in particle physics, uh, quite comparable to the impact that uh, the discovery of the Higgs particle had on supersymmetric theories. Uh, so uh, I'll just mention there's a poster uh, this afternoon that will tell you about improvements that we have coming up. But these can be summarized in this slide. We have an ongoing uh, push to improve by another order of magnitude. Uh, there are other experiments that are competing with us. And in the long term, we think we may, able to, may be able to push at least this far with this basic technique. Uh, so with that, I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Okay, now it's time for some questions. Just a quick question. You suggested that as the atoms pass through the detection region, before they escape, you reverse the, you, check, you rotate the polarization so you can look at it. Does that suggest to me that the uh, molecule source is pulsed? The molecule source is pulsed, yeah. I but even, okay. even if it were a continuous wave, we could do that. So the the detection beam has a finite width. The molecules have a finite velocity. So uh, we, the intensity is such that they're excited with near unit probability before they're halfway through the beam. And then we switch the polarization. Yeah. OK, Bill. So could you show that beautiful Gaussian that, uh, that had the, uh, uh, the width of uh, 3.7 times uh, 10 to the minus 29? So, so, so my question is, uh, that looked like what you were quoting as a, um, uh, as a statistical uncertainty was what I would call the standard deviation, the sample standard deviation of all those points. Uh, sorry, yeah, that's, that's a typo. That's the standard error in the mean, of course. Oh, is, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I was going to say, wow, you're really conservative. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. No, it's the standard error in the mean. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay, so then do I get a real question? <laughs> okay, so could you go back to the microwave spectroscopy uh -huh. with the, the curved uh, plates? Yeah. Coming up here. There we go. One back, yeah. Yep. Right, so it sure looks like the data doesn't fit. Oh, sorry. So this is, this is not a fit. So right, blue, it's, it's what you expect. It's but yeah, it's what we what we expect simply from the measured curvature of the electric field yeah. plates uh, about a year and a half before the data was taken. Yeah. So what happened? So <laughs> I would say uh, most likely things drifted in that intervening year and a half. Um, you know, you, you can see this is this is on the millivolt per centimeter scale out of our total applied field of 100 volts per centimeter. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the, the fact that this matched reasonably well made us extraordinarily happy, I would say, uh, just because it was so long between our ability to take this uh, measurement of the plate spacing and our ability to measure the electric fields inside that, uh, in some sense, I would take away that the, fields, the, the field plates barely moved at all. So let's say that it wasn't that. Let's say there was something that you didn't know about. Mm -hmm. How much of a, of a problem would that have caused on the EDM? Right, so the, the absolute value of the magnetic, or sorry, the absolute value of the electric field we're, we're extraordinarily insensitive to. Mm -hmm. It's the non-reversing component of the electric field that we're sensitive to, and, and we're able to measure that with much smaller error bars here. Mm -hmm. And of course that, our prediction is it should be zero, but there's obviously some patch fields and other effects going on, but uh, this is, Clearly not constant, but uh, it's small enough to be 
to be perfectly reasonable everywhere and not cause a yeah. problem. So it's time to move on. So uh, the next talk is uh, the next.